All right. Uh, so welcome, everyone, to the fifth annual CSCS crash course. Um, we're having sessions all day, so we hope you can stay for at least a few of them. Uh, and at the end, at 4.30, there's going to be a reception to celebrate the fifth year um, downstairs um, to the left of where you came in, in room one. Um, and if you have any questions about uh, the events today, you can go to the registration desk where you hopefully signed in, uh, and they should be able to help you with your questions. Uh, so our first uh, presenter today is Liz Spencer, the Dogwood Dyer. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming bright and early this morning to hear me speak. Um, so I am an artist. My background is in... Uh, fine arts, um, and I actually came to natural dyeing by accident. <laughs> um, I would not have imagined myself three years ago um, actually uh, owning my own business and um, doing this for a living. <clears throat> so you never know where you may end up. Um, but uh, I just want to talk to you guys about what I do, uh, natural dyeing, and then in particular growing plants for the purpose of uh, using them for color. Um, this is an image here from a workshop that I led last year in a garden uh, in Brooklyn, Prospect Heights Community Farm. If anybody's in that area, I highly recommend checking out that garden. Um, and uh, an indigo dyed piece of silk. Um, my background is, um, like I said, in the arts. I have an undergraduate degree in studio art uh, with painting. Uh, photography, um, and I got interested in sustainability by way of fiber arts, um, and then pursued my master's degree at the London College of Fashion um, in sustainable fashion. So um, I actually started uh, gardening in London um, with no gardening experience um, as a side project um, to to basically um, collaborate with the community garden there and. Um, start with a, a dye garden so that the students could actually um, grow their own colors. And um, I also did an internship with a place called the Textile Arts Center. I don't know if you, any of you are familiar with uh, the Textile Arts Center there in Brooklyn, their main um, campus, and then they have an auxiliary space in Manhattan. Um, but they had a wonderful program uh, that's now in its fourth or fifth year. Um, in which they actually started the first CSA for dye plants in the country. Um, and this is just an image of me teaching a rust dyeing workshop in that garden space. Unfortunately, that garden space is no longer in existence because the space was, um, was, uh, had to be given up uh, because it was, um, uh, there was construction, but the space was, is no longer a garden, it's now a, a building. Um, but it basically was a garden in which every plant had dye properties and the initial, I don't know if you're all familiar with the, um, with the idea of a CSA, um, mostly to do with, with growing food, um, but uh, people or uh, fellows would actually uh, invest at the beginning of, this, of the growing season and then would get um, shares to pick up throughout the season of dye stuffs in which to use for, um, for dyeing and uh, many textile artists. And we kind of came up a, a, up against a few um, limitations of the space in that it was too small, really, to grow the quantity that you need for um, growing enough plant for, for a dyeing purpose. So it was mostly an educational garden, but this program, Sowing Seeds, has actually branched out into five or six gardens that are existing in Brooklyn now, and so they have a wider reach, uh, which turns out to be a better um, system for, for the project altogether. Um, like I said, I, I teach um, workshops. Um, I, I like teaching to all ages, mostly because um, natural dyes really are appropriate for all ages. This is just an image of um, a participant, my youngest participant from that workshop, uh, with um, flower eco print. So basically, just putting the flower on the fabric and um, hammering it into the fabric. And uh, I think that was uh, nasturtium and dahlia. And my business, the Dogwood Dyer, um, is basically a service for fashion designers and home goods designers um, that are looking for color application with only natural dyes. I only use natural dyes. I don't use any synthetic chemicals. Um, everything is either locally grown, foraged, or ethically sourced. 
Um, and when I say foraged, I mean going out of the city and picking things that are either invasive or wildly abundant. I don't pick anything, and even when it is abundant, I try to keep my picking at 10% of what's, um, what's there in the space. Um, and uh, so my, my business is, um, is there for designers who don't have the time really to, um, to learn the natural dye process because it kind of has a long learning curve. There's a lot to it, there's a ton of variables, and um, I feel that a lot of people come into natural dyes and get discouraged because uh, there are quite a few steps and important steps that if missed or skipped, um, the results are disappointing. Which is actually my experience. The first time I ever naturally dyed, I picked a bunch of dandelions in my yard and overboiled them, didn't mordant, um, and was dissatisfied with the experience and then um, came back to it a few years later. But uh, I feel that the process itself is just um, something that uh, there's a need in the market for more and more so for natural dyes so um, that is now what I offer um, to designers in the city. Uh, just an image of some of the, dry, the dried dye stuffs that um, I grow and collect. And then some images of um, some of the work that I've done. Um, Titania Inglis is a wonderful women's wear designer uh, working in the city. Rebecca Atwood um, does home goods. These are some, this is a pillow project we worked on together. I did all the natural dyeing. The gray color comes from chestnut with an iron modifier. And then the pink color comes from avocado skins. Uh, Marisol Esteles is a, a designer. Um, and most of these are silks. There's a few uh, bamboo, bamboo rayons mixed in. Um, but a very fun project. This is actually an example of doing yardage dyeing, um, and this piece here actually is garment dyed, so dyed after the garment's made, whereas these pieces were all dyed in yardage format. So I want to talk a little bit about the process of natural dyeing. Um, it's a bit different than dyeing with chemical dyes. Um, the steps are distinct from each other to get the best, um, the best uh, results possible. Um, this image is of goldenrod that is very abundant um, all throughout the East Coast. Um, there are many varieties of goldenrod, all of which give a beautiful color, which you would expect from something called goldenrod. Um, and it's usually the flower that I collect, but the entire plant will give a beautiful yellow color. And yellow is actually, um, I find it a bit ironic that I'd say 95% of the plants that will give a color will give a yellow color, which is maybe not everyone's favorite color. I would say it's probably the least color, least favorite color of all of the colors, but um, green is actually um, one of the most, or a true bright green is one of the most difficult colors to find in nature, and it actually doesn't really exist, and it comes from a two-step process um, where you over dye. You would start with something like yellow, and then over dye with a blue to get that green color. So. I think it's sort of funny that green is very abundant in the natural world, but to get that spring grass green, um, it's, a, it's a bit elusive uh, in the natural dye process. So the first step in natural dyeing is actually to apply your fixative to your cloth or your fiber. Um, and it's called a mordant. And mordant actually comes, uh, the root word, uh, the Latin um, and the French word mordre means to bite. So it's essentially the connection between the fiber and the color. Um, and there are different types of mordant. There are metal salts, um, the most common of which is alum, and it's naturally occurring, it's mined. Um, and then there's also uh, another metal salt, um, iron, that I use is also a modifier. So iron can act as a binding agent as well as change the color of the, of the dye. Um, and uh, I, I try not to, or I, I've, I've basically decided uh, not to use any heavy metals in my practice. A lot of older dyers' manuals um, reference using tin, chrome, and copper, um, which are wonderful for getting, uh, for their, they're actually wonderful modifiers as well. Um, they can give you quite a beautiful array of colors just from one dye plant, um, but they're heavy metals, and so I don't use them. Uh, they're not great to put back into the natural world. 
in, in concentrated doses, which is what you would do, which is what would happen if you were to use them in your practice. Um, and they're, bio, they accumulate, they're bioaccumulators, they accumulate in um, bioorganisms, so um, it's not something that I suggest you use, but if you do use, please use them responsibly. Um, and then there are also plant-based mordants, uh, many of which um, are um, easily found, foraged, or grown, such as rhubarb leaves. Um, rhubarb stalks obviously are edible, but the leaves themselves are toxic. They're not to be eaten, and so they're usually either composted or thrown away. And so it's a wonderful use because the oxalic acid that's present in the leaves is actually what binds, is, acts as a mordant. Um, sumac leaves. Um, anything with lots of tannin, so tannin-rich plants such as oak, um, all parts of the oak tree, especially the acorns, and particularly the galls, which are actually not um, not uh, a natural uh, phenomenon. It's actually it's a natural phenomenon, but it's not to do with the actual oak tree. It's it's a wasp that embeds itself in the oak um, stem, and then the oak tree grows around um, that that wasp nest, and that is actually one of the most uh, tannin-rich sources you'll ever find in nature. Um, other, other plants such as uh, simplicos, alum root, um, and one-seeded juniper also have uh, mordant uh, binding properties. Um, the, the Navajo Indians actually used to use the one-seeded juniper, and it's actually the needle ash, or the burned needle ash, which has mordant properties. Um, and then um, sumac leaves I use quite often, um, they're very, again, it's another very abundant plant. So the mordanting process is done beforehand. Um, you basically put whatever it is that has the mordant properties in hot water, uh, dissolve it as, as, as best as possible, or extract the mordant from it if it's a plant-based and not a metal salt, um, and then sift out whatever sort of residue you have, and then that's your vat for mordant. You mordant your fiber. Um, a lot of times I like to uh, cold mordant, meaning that if you have the extra time to wait and you don't need to apply heat, you don't have to, you can just um, let it, let the fiber sit in the, the vat for um, an extended period of time. Any application of heat is usually just to speed up the process of the dyeing and the mordanting. Um, and then this is just an image of um, a garment being dyed in uh, a hot water extraction where um, after it's mordanted, you make the extraction of uh, the color from the dye plant. Osage orange um, is actually the heartwood of a tree um, that is a native species in the US. And it is, um, I prefer using a hot water extraction method with this because it's a harder, um, tougher material. So um, that's another wonderful aspect of using a hot water or, or applying heat to your, to your dye vats um, is to get um, as much color as possible out of the harder substances, such as barks and woods. And then this is just an image of the color that you can get from Osage Orange. So it's called Osage Orange, but it usually gives more of a yellow, golden color. Um, this is an organic cotton scarf um, in which I've applied an etajime technique, which is a Japanese shibori, um, where the, the shape of the block that you use to sandwich the fabric between the, determines the geometric shape that you can get onto the cloth. Um, and then an example of a plant that I would only use a cold water extraction with is sumac berries. Um, sumac is, the berries particularly, I like to collect and then only use uh, a cold water extraction because the color you can get from them is actually quite beautiful as opposed to what you can get from um, from just a cold, from a hot water extraction. So this this color here that's most intense in the middle is actually the result of a cold water extraction. Whereas if you were to apply heat, you get more of a tan muted pink color. So oftentimes applying heat can actually dull the color. So um, from experimenting and um, trial and error, I found that there are some plants that actually it, it would be better for a slower process with cold water. Sumac is very abundant. Like I said, the, uh, the berry is a winter berry, so it comes out in August, September, and usually stays all the way through the winter. You may even see, if you go out of the city upstate, um, sumac berries still hanging on from this last season. Um, and this is another example of um, the color, but the, the color here in my book is much more indicative. Sorry for the, the uh, 
the color is not perfect for on this image. Another um, technique of extracting and dyeing is another slow process, um, solar dyeing. So usually appropriate for something um, on a smaller scale, obviously depending upon the, the size of the vessel that you can get. Um, glass is appropriate for this technique um, where you put everything in one container. You put your mordant, your fabric, your dye stuff, um, and uh, a little bit of water and seal it up and put it in a sunny window or a place where there, it will experience heat and let the, the slow process or the sun do the, the dyeing and the extracting for you. Um, so I just want to talk now about my experience as a gardener. Um, I feel like my practice as a natural dyer is a bit different from uh, other dyers out there because I did start with gardening first. So the plants that I uh, was, was planting, uh, the, the bed that I built in London, um, was my first experience gardening and um, you know I was growing these plants before I'd even had a chance to die with them. So at the London College of Fashion um, in East London in Hackney there was just this wasted space that was really um, more of a nuisance to the college than anything because they had to mow it and it was constantly being littered and so um, I put together a funding proposal and we started a dye garden with the in collaboration with the next door community garden um, and this is just a before and after shot of the bed. And then after my first season growing in London and returning back to the United States, um, you know, I just, I'm, I'm new to New York relatively. I've been here for about two years, but um, never having actually been in um, such a constrained, um, <laughs> basically just not having growing space. So this is my first garden experience in, in Manhattan. Um, and then upon moving to Brooklyn, my partner and I collaborated um, to basically just take space and um, also create an opportunity for our local community. Um, so every, without the, within the five boroughs, there are um, trees along sidewalks and every tree pit um, is basically either guarded or unguarded, many of which in our immediate neighborhood are unguarded. And um, especially after since the Million Trees Initiative has, has just planted so many um, trees and spent so much time and effort, um, uh, many of these trees are, are young saplings and are vulnerable. Um, and so building the tree guards actually helps protect the trees. Um, it creates, uh, it prevents from soil compaction. Um, print, uh, planting many different types of plants in the tree pit really is, is beneficial for the tree itself because of biodiversity. Um, it draws in wildlife. Um, and the, tr the bench itself, um, or the, the tree guard itself, has the bench top, um, which is great too because it helps create community. For instance, the owner of the bodega outside of our apartment where we built our first tree guard now has a place to sit instead of pulling a milk crate out and sitting um, and a place to admire the, be the beautiful plants too. So this is our first tree guard that we built. Um, I, you know, implanted all, or I put all of my little tiny starts. Um, and then after the project grew, after our first season growing, we had community volunteer days and were able to build 15. So we now have 15 within our immediate block neighborhood, block radius. Um, and we're actually not far from here. We're in Bed-Stuy um, on Troop and Pulaski. So if you're ever curious and you're in that neighborhood, feel free to walk by and check out the tree guards. Um, but this is our um, dye, dye plant starting um, project. Basically, our second bedroom became our grow room. Um, so these are all of our seed starts from last season. Um, and this is just an image of the, one of the tree guards um, in full bloom in, I think this was September. Um, so it's called the Brooklyn Tree Guard. And my partner is a landscape designer. His business is called uh, the, uh, the Urban Landscape Company. And so he designed the planter bed, and I planted them. Just another image, black-eyed Susan Coreopsis. And there really aren't many, uh, there are no real regulations as far as building ad hoc in the um, building these tree guards. Um, we've talked to the city, and the only two stipulations that they've given us are that the guard has to be 12 inches away from the curb so that car doors can open, and that it has to be at least 18 inches high. Um, and so those are really the only rules that, um, that we have to follow. 
So now I want to talk about um, specific plants that I really love using that I think are um, integral to any natural dyer's practice, at least mine. Um, and then a few guidelines for growing natural dyes, um, the first of which is determining the colors that you'd like to achieve. Um, my favorite colors are my favorite plants that I think are very important because of these specific colors. Red, blue, and purple tend to be some of the most difficult to, colors to find in nature, and there are only a few plants that really give true, fast colors. Fast meaning it won't fade or wash out. Um, I mean, everything fades and washes out, even chemical, chemical dyes do. Chemical dyes tend to be more stable than natural dyes generally, but if you mortar properly and um, choose the right plant, then you're going to get the best results that actually last as long as possible and, and don't change. Um, so matter root in, and ladies veg straw root are two plants that give beautiful reds from, from the root. Um, and they're investment plants that take about three to five years to where you can actually um, harvest the root because you want the root to be thick enough to have accumulated enough color. Um, indigo and woad are the only two plants in nature that give a blue color, so they're very valuable. Um, hollyhock flowers and Hopi sunflower seeds are two beautiful um, give two beautiful di different shades of purple. Another consideration for growing uh, dye plants is, you know, beauty. You want pretty plants, right? You don't want a bunch of fl flat, ugly plants. You want things that flower. Um, and so some of my favorites for, especially that flower and have um, uh, aesthetic purposes, uh, Dahlia, Black-Eyed Susan, Coreopsis, Hollyhock, Zinnia. And then also I try to plant as many native plants as possible. Um, and then goldenrod, I haven't planted much just because it's so abundant in this region and I can go out and forage it and it really is uh, not something that, um, it's not really found in the city, but um, it is definitely, if you have a garden space, I would recommend goldenrod. Black walnut, it's the actual husk of the, of the black walnut, um, basically the fruit that surrounds the nut and shell itself that gives the dye. Um, Osage orange I spoke about earlier, and then Hopi sunflower seeds. Um, and then what, as well as inexpensive, easy to care for, low maintenance, drought tolerant plants. Those are very important, um, especially since uh, I'm growing, uh, I don't want to put a ton of water into my, or extra water apart from what um, comes down in rain into my dye beds. So marigold, black-eyed Susan, hollyhock, coreopsis, all really wonderful for those properties. And then you also want to consider, if you have a small space to grow, which I do, you want to think about yield, which is how much color is going to come from the pound of plants that you're growing and harvesting. Um, so some of the best for those include indigo, coreopsis, weld, chrysanthemum, and marigold. Um, so I want to outline a couple of um, important plants, starting with the Hopi purple sunflower seed. Um, the Hopi Native Americans used to use um, this the seed particularly to dye their basketry and textiles um, and it's the seed that you're after although sunflowers every variety of sunflowers will give a beautiful color uh, from a golden yellow to a green um, this variety particularly is native and the seeds give a very beautiful purple um, to gray to black there's another image of sunflowers growing on the rooftop um, of my building and this is just an image, the purple here, it's kind of dark in the projection, but uh, the purple is a result of a direct application onto fa fabric of the purple, purple Hopi sunflower seeds. Um, another favorite of every dyer, I feel, is uh, indigo. And the variety specifically that I grow is Japanese indigo, <clears throat> Polygon tinctorium. Um, it's it's best to grow in this zone and this in our climate, and it can deal with the, the temperate weather that we have. Uh, whereas the um, the tropical variety of indigo would not you would not be able to grow here. It needs a long hot summer, whereas the Japanese indigo is fine with the the length and heat of summer that we have here. And this is just an image of my indigo flowering. Um, I save my seeds at the end of every growing season. I'll usually pick the most uh, virulent and um, and most beautiful plants to, to save my seed from. Uh, during harvest. And then just an image of two different varieties of indigo right next to each other. Um, indigo is, is very, it, it's 
uh, different species of indigo are naturally occurring all throughout the world. Um, and they all give a blue color. Some have more concentration of blue pigment in them than others. Um, and the, the indigo, like I said, the Japanese indigo um, is, is my favorite. This is just an image of um, fresh leaf dyeing. So because of the fact that I'm growing small amounts of indigo and I don't have, um, it's not worth uh, the, the process of composting and, um, and or the j traditional Japanese technique of um, composting down the leaves and then um, creating a sukumo. I actually just do a fresh leaf dye, which is a, literally as simple as putting the the indigo leaves in a blender with cold water and then soaking your fiber or whatever it is that you're dyeing. Generally, silk and wool are best for this application. Cotton and bast fibers um, and anything that comes from a plant is, is usually not going to give you a good result, but silk and wool give gorgeous turquoise colors and no more than necessary. Indigo is actually different. It's, um, it's a substantive dye, meaning that there is no mordant um, required. Some more images of some indigo uh, during um, hanging dry to dry at, at a workshop in the Prospect Heights community farm. And then another point to make about indigo, um, it's unique in that the color can be built up over various dips. So because of the process, um, because it needs uh, oxygen in order for the color to actually transform from indigo white to indigo blue, um, you dip various times to get a deep, deep color. So the, the blue hemp silk fabric hanging on the left is one dip, and then on the right is three dips. Um, if you've never taken an indigo workshop or if you're interested in natural dyes, I would recommend starting with indigo because it is so different. Um, and the process is magical. It's, it's sort of hard to explain without seeing it yourself, but to see the color transform when you pull it out of the vat from white to green to blue is just it's, um, it never gets old with me. Uh, another one of my favorite plants, because it's so hardy and easy to grow, it's almost impossible to kill marigold, is marigold. Um, it's very popular. It's easy to get seeds from marigold. Um, and there are a lot of different beautiful varieties. Um, I pick my marigold flowers throughout the season. I'll usually, obviously, leave half for the bees, but you know, pick as they bloom. The more you pick, the more they will bloom, actually. It's an image of some marigolds um, that have been dried, and then um, after I accumulate enough, I will make a, make a dye back. This is the color you can get on wool from marigold. Another of my favorites is Coreopsis. It's also another very uh, easy to find plant or, or seeds. Um, and it's the flower you're after, so I pick the flowers throughout the season. Um, some Coreopsis growing in the Brooklyn Tree Guard. More Coreopsis, some dried, some fresh. And then some of the color you can get from Coreopsis. Everything from a yellow to um, more of like a moody orange. Uh, purple basil is a lovely plant because it's obviously edible. So um, although with the Brooklyn Tree Guards, I generally don't eat anything that I grow in the Brooklyn Tree Guards. I actually think it's, um, it's just wonderful that I can grow in these Brooklyn Tree Guards. I think it's a unique opportunity because of the fact that they aren't edibles, so there's no worry about soil testing, heavy metals coming off the street, pollution. Um, if you're growing on a rooftop, that's fine because the heavy metals are just, they, the particulate doesn't make its way up to the roof. Um, but with purple basil, um, I generally just use it for as a dye stuff. Whereas if you're growing on your roof, you could you know, put it on your pizza, but um, it is uh, a wonderful plant. I pick it fresh. I only use it fresh. Unfortunately, as far as I found, it doesn't really work in a, as a dried dye stuff, so it's one of those that has to be used on the spot. Um, this color is a slaty blue. It's actually not a true blue like you can get with indigo, but it is, it's more of a gray blue, but I'm experimenting more and more with the purple basil. Um, it's very pH sensitive, meaning that depending upon if you add a modifier of something acidic like a vinegar or in the other direction, something that's more uh, base like a baking soda, um, it can change quite, quite a bit. 
and the color actually changes, or the colors I found I can get a different color throughout the season. So in the beginning of the season, the color is a bit softer, and then as the leaves get more and more sun, um, they turn a deeper purple, and you can get deeper, darker colors. Hollyhock, or specifically black hollyhock, is um, a wonderful plant that I I love growing. It's a, it's also another investment plant because it's a biennial, meaning that you won't get blossoms or, or it won't bloom until the second year because of um, if you were in the south, it might actually bloom the first year, but um, the hollyhocks here take two years to bloom. Um, the taller plants here are, are hollyhocks that get quite big. I love planting them just because it really adds variety and depth to the garden itself. Um, and they're just about to bloom there. And then this is just an image of the sort of color you can get from hollyhock. It's that purple color out there. Uh, another direct application. This is a bundle dye. It's a technique that I like to employ for the dye stuffs that I grow. I'm growing in smaller quantities, so I can get more of an effect by actually applying maybe a handful of the Hopi purple sunflower seeds and, uh, versus if I were to make a dye that out of that handful, um, the color would not go as far. Another image of the, the black hollyhock in a, in a bundle dye direct application. Um, matter root is, like I said, the really one of the only dye stuffs that will give a true red. Um, after a few years, you harvest the root. I haven't harvested any of my matter root um, because it's, I've only, we're coming up on our third growing season. And then this is just an image of a alpaca knit hat with uh, the matter root um, dyed at the at the hem there. Matter root also, depending upon, um, I like to exhaust all of my vats, meaning that um, after I've dyed something, if there's still if there's still color left in in the pot, um, then I'll continue to dye things in it and get lighter and lighter shades. So this is more. Um, this is a a matter vat that has kind of gone a bit exhausted, so you can get more pink um, as you get. You can also use modifiers like acids, like vinegar and acetic acid, to get more of a coral color. Hot marigold is quite common. Um, calendula also has um, healing properties. Dahlia is also very common in very many gardens, um, already exists, and it's any color of, of the flower that, you, that you're after, they'll all give a, a yellow. Um, and I just wanted to mention woad quickly. Um, ind I think indigo gets a lot of glory in the blue natural dye world, but woad also is the other blue uh, producing natural dye plant um, and was used for centuries in Europe um, was the only source of blue before um, indigo was discovered in India, or at least from the Europeans. Um, and it has less indigo, or it has less uh, blue pigment in the leaves, I'd say about a quarter than what uh, per pound indigo has, but it's very valuable. It's still a wonderful plant to grow. Um, additional dye plants, I just wanted to, just a quick list here. Sunflowers um, are, are very key because they have, you know, you can save the seeds um, as edibles. Um, dyer's chamomile, um, all different types of, um, of fruit trees. The barks can give very beautiful colors, such as cherry, plum, apricot. Um, uh, the, birch, the birch outer bark, which I don't take off the tree, I only take if it's on the ground. Um, Black-eyed Susan, Queen Anne's Lace. And then I just wanted to talk briefly about dyeing with berries. So I don't, I've sort of made the decision at this point to stop dyeing with berries. It's fun to do for, um, for workshops and to talk about color from natural sources, um, but it generally tends to be quite fugitive, any color coming from a berry. Um, there are a few berries that I still pick and use that, that I forage locally, such as pokeberry, um, because of the fact that it is inedible and it's toxic, so it's something that is, is quite abundant. Um, but this is just an image of the elderberries and then the color that you can get, um, but has since faded to uh, 
um, you know, it's it's more of a stain than anything, and it's it's really I, I feel like it's more valuable on a pie than it is on a scarf. So, um, but I, that's also the beauty of natural dyeing. They're not they're they're living colors. They do uh, age and change. So it's just something to be aware of that if you're dyeing with berries, um, then to expect it to fade. And if it does, then that's okay, and you can over dye it or um, you know, accept that that is what that's what nature gives. Um, and just a list here of some great plants that are also dual purpose, whether they be edible, herbal, medicinal, um, and then some things that actually are coming uh, food scraps, such as the tops of the carrots, um, the greens, um, onion skins, red cabbage, beetroot. Um, anytime I've uh, indicated fugitive, just that just means that it generally tends to to fade. Um, bronze fennel, <clears throat> so there are a lot of edibles um, that you can actually, I mentioned avocado, avocado pits and skins, I always save and dry because they have uh, beautiful, they get a very subtle, like blush pink color, which you wouldn't think of coming from an avocado. Um, I also wanted to mention um, another garden that I had a hand in and I was quite honored to be um, a mentor for at the Fashion Institute of Technology. They've since built, um, they've had, they're coming up on their second growing season, um, a rooftop dye garden. Um, and in collaboration with the Brooklyn Grange, who built the beds and the students there, um, picked out all the seeds and had a very successful first growing season. This is the garden in full bloom in October. Um, just an image of some seeds. I love the diversity of the seeds as much as I do the diversity of the plants themselves. Um, and then just another image of uh, a workshop line, all the different sorts of colors you can get from locally sourced. Um, the purple comes from hollyhock that I've grown. The pink comes from pokeberry that's locally picked. The yellow comes from goldenrod. And then I just wanted to mention a few people, uh, a few fashion designers that are actually currently using natural dyes or have used. Um, Colorant is a wonderful, uh, she's, she's worked mostly in knitwear uh, and is now working in wovens. Um, Dosa has constantly gorgeous, beautiful stuff um, and has been working with natural dyes for the past few seasons. Uh, knit Brewery did a wonderful knit collection of uh, indigo yarn dyed. So yarn dyeing, it's sort of difficult to see because the colors sort of, or the this, this slide is dark, um, or the project, projection's dark, but yarn dyeing so, uh, can give you quite a beautiful variation, whereas if you were to dye um, in a garment state, you get more of a flat color, whereas dyeing with the yarn um, can give subtle variation. Um, Ad and George is a, a fashion line um, in collaboration uh, with Sasha Dewar, who's a, uh, a heralded natural dyer um, in Southern California. Um, uh, menswear Simon Miller has worked exclusively in indigo for the past two seasons, and then even mainstream J Crew has even done some natural dye uh, limited edition T-shirts. Um, and then a wave awake is a beautiful women's wear uh, line, mostly silks, all naturally dyed. So it's pretty amazing the color that you can get from plants alone. And then some of my favorite natural dyeing resources, if you're interested, um, Kremer Pigments is a local source of, of dye stuffs. I teach workshops at Kremer. Um, they're really the only place in the city where you can actually buy natural dye stuffs. Um, and they also sell the mordants and everything that you'd need. Um, Indie Growing Blue is specific to indigo. Roland Ricketts is really, um, I'd say, an indigo master, um, growing fields of indigo in Indiana, at the University of Indiana. Um, and his website, Indie Growing Blue, uh, there is information about growing indigo, processing it. Um, and then the Facebook group specifically is a wonderful community of natural dyers all to do, well, natural dyers, uh, mostly specifically to do with indigo. If you have any indigo questions, just ask and you'll get 15 answers. Um, and then one of my favorite books uh, is Wild Color by Jenny Dean, not only because of the fact that she goes over every single plant, um, its historical origin, and it's the colors that you can get, um, but she also talks about how to grow the plants. Um, a dyer's garden, more uh, dye garden 
uh, guidelines by Rita Buchanan. Uh, Botanical Colors, if you can't find what you need at Kremer, then you can buy uh, through Botanical Colors. She's a Seattle-based natural dye stuff supplier. Um, and uh, the Plant Morden Project, uh, which is a wonderful project. Please check it out. Um, using plants only for mordant to avoid any mining uh, if you don't want to uh, contribute to um, alum mining. Um, and then also Turkey Red Journal is a quarterly natural dye newsletter that has an online presence as well at turkeyredjournal.com. Um, and then I have a few workshops coming up. Um, like I said, I teach at Kremer. The Painting on Silk and the Itajime and Arashi are coming up. Um, April 18th and April 25th. And then I'm very excited about my Earth Day celebration uh, batik natural dye class at Hi Ho Batik in Brooklyn. Um, it's sure to be fun. Batik is actually, if you don't know, a technique where you use wax um, applied onto the cloth and then the wax dries and then that's the resist if you want to make any pattern and then you dye the cloth and then you can melt the wax off of the fabric and you have um, a resist resisted technique. Um, but if you're interested, um, sign up on my newsletter, um, and then you can, you know, register for classes on my website, and also please sign up on my newsletter if you're interested in receiving any information about workshops in the future or news. Um, I also wanted to just speak really quickly about a couple of, um, I mean, I think natural dyes get a lot of flack because of the fact that they are fugitive, um, or more so than chemical dyes. Um, when done properly, um, they will last, um, I think, as long as they need to. Uh, but a lot of people ask the question, of why natural dyes over synthetic? Um, I think any dye process itself, synthetic and natural, uses a lot of water. Um, there are some technologies that use, um, that use air as a, as a dye application, which actually only work with synthetic materials. Um, so any natural material, any cotton, any wool, any silk, uses lots of water for dye application, whether it's synthetic or, or natural. Um, but when using chemical dyes uh, with water, if the water isn't treated properly after it's leaving the factory, um, which is often the case in where most of our clothing is dyed, which is in China and in India, um, then obviously the dye stuffs and the chemicals, uh, many of which are known to be hormone disruptors and cancer causing, just go directly into the watershed there. Um, so that's a, a wonderful bonus or a, an advantage to using natural dyes is that, um, is that there really is no issue there. Um, and that, you know, anything in, everything in moderation, right? Nothing in, um, nothing in, anything can be toxic when in, highly concentrated doses. So just keeping that in mind as far as with my practice, my water that I use, I recycle my mordants as much as possible, meaning that I don't throw my water bath, my, my mordant bath out, I'll reuse it um, to get and just add more mordant to it so I don't have to continually add that to the municipal water stream. Um, and much of my water is actually recycled back into my dye bed. So anything that doesn't have high amounts of iron I will pour back into my dye bed because it's basically just flowers that have been extracted into water. Um, and so I try to keep my water use down as much as possible. Um, and it, but it's actually my, my main concern as far as ecological and environmental impact is, is the use of water. Um, so my dream is to collaborate with someone, um, someone that can basically harness a natural dye pigment and perhaps even a digital printing application um, something where you can really cut down on water use. Um, another wonderful thing that I love about uh, why I would use natural dyes over synthetic um, is just because of the fact that it encourages using animal fibers over plant fibers. I love cotton, I love hemp, and I love linen, um, but they generally tend to be a little harder on the earth as far as all of the water and energy that goes into them to grow them and to produce them. Um, cotton is the fabric of our lives, but it I feel like it's it's a little bit too prevalent in, in the fashion and garment and apparel industry. Um, so I really want um, to encourage, since natural dyes have a greater affinity for animal fibers such as wool and alpaca and silk, um, to to use them more since they work, uh, you get brighter, beautiful, more beautiful colors with those fabrics. Um, and then also, obviously, allowing the replication of a historical process, natural dyes definitely wins over synthetic. Um, and then gaining independence over non-renewable non resources such as oil. So 
If you didn't know, synthetic dyes come from oil because they're chemicals. So natural dyes are definitely renewable. We can continue growing them. Um, they're not for everything, obviously, not for performance wear. You can't dye synthetic materials. And um, there's you know, not enough arable land on Earth to grow all the dye stuffs we'd need to dye all the clothing that we consume. Um, so it, would, it very much encourages reduction of consumption um, if you were to, you know, to use natural dyes on a smaller, slower scale. <laughs> Thank you. And I think we might have a couple of minutes, maybe a minute for questions, if anybody has questions. For Mordant, I usually... I have used Simplicos, and um, the only downside of using a plant-based mordant is that it, it does add a little bit of color onto the cloth, so it'll make it more of a like a beige to start, so you can't get like a, a bright white base.